Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Oh, welcome to the Dharma Doors. As usual, I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective Zooming Classroom. And tonight, we are about to embark on part two of the questions of Bodhisattva Sumati, otherwise known as the Sumati Dharika Sutra, otherwise known as the Sumati Dharika Paripricha Sutra. This was all covered in part one, where we went over the title. We were introduced to our um, star of the show, a um, an eight-year-old uh, daughter of an elder of... Um, of Rajgriha. So that's where we're at. We're in Rajgriha. The Buddha's chilling on Mount Gridrakuta, the peak of vultures, vultures peak. Um, and just to quickly bring us back up to where we are from last time, the Dadika, the daughter or young girl Sumati, whose name means uh, subtle intellect, something like that, beautiful mind, something like that. Uh, the young Dharika Sumati came to the Tathagata, came to the Buddha, and asked a series of 10 questions. And just very quickly, in a way, just because it'll help bring us um, right up to speed where we're at tonight, her questions, the, what we, the way I introduced them in part one, was that these questions, you know, this is an eight-year-old girl who spent a little bit of time talking about what that might signify or mean. You know, I think in any interpretation, the, obviously the, the literal interpretation, but also any metaphorical or figurative interpretation, they all sort of imply a certain youth, youthfulness. Eight, eight years old is young, kind of no matter how you cut it in that way. And so she, Sumati, is very much kind of the novice, if you will, the beginner. Um, and sort of these questions very much represent the sort of initial questions of the aspirant, the bodhisattva aspirant, the one who aspires to be a bodhisattva or to bodhisattvahood. These are sort of questions that are uh, kind of about that. And as I introduced it, this was about the Bodhisattva practice. But I wanted to pre uh, preface tonight with this idea of, of her age, her youth, representing this sort of the novice, because like we said last time, there's a way to read these questions that they're about rebirth. Like next time, you know, and th there's a way, of course, in which ideas of reincarnation and rebirth are predicated on the idea of death and then rebirth next time around. And what you do this time leads to a better rebirth. And so these questions, like her first question was basically, how do you get reborn in a good body? Essentially, it's what the Chinese says too. Like, how do you get born in a, in a body with good features, a good looking body, essentially? How do you get reborn in a wealthy, noble family? How do you get reborn in a harmonious family? How do you get reborn on a lotus? Uh, how do you get reborn in multiple Buddha lands? How do you get um, reborn basically in a world that has no enmity or animosity? How do you get reborn in a world in which you are considered trustworthy? How do you get reborn in a world without hindrances? How do you get reborn in a world free of the deeds of Mara, free of evil deeds? And then ultimately, how do you get reborn in a world in which one can see many Buddhas? And so those are the 10 questions really quickly, if you weren't here last time or you wanted a refresher. And again, the way that there's sort of, it's sort of the way the sutra works, is that they're sort of supposed to be a little naive in that sense of like, how do I get reborn, you know, with a, with a, a good looking body, graceful features, as the text says. And then the Buddha replies to each of Sumati's questions with these four part answers, 
four practices that one can do to achieve a, a graceful features. Four things that one can do to achieve wealth and nobility. And I've, I've put here on the side, these are for tonight. We did the first three questions uh, last time. And I've sort of put a, a paraphrase of like what the answer to that quite, how do you get reborn with graceful features, right? Well, the Buddha says, don't be angry, even with a good friend. Always have metta, right? Rejoice, rejoice in the true teachings, but rejoice, like, be, you know, joy. And make images of the Buddha. And, and that last one was kind of a funny play on the idea of graceful features. Like, how do I obtain graceful features? Make a beautiful image of the Buddha with graceful features. Then you'll obtain graceful features. What are you talking about? So a lot of the answers were kind of funny like that. And, uh, you know, of course, and so I'm paraphrasing the answer to how to obtain graceful features is to have metta, loving kindness, or not anger towards a, a bad friend, or joy, rejoicing. So again, I'm just kind of condensing or paraphrasing the four-part answer. Please refer, refer to the text and the four-part answer for the whole, the whole thing. But metta, loving kindness was this answer. And then how do I obtain wealth? Give gifts. <laughs> that was the answer to that one. Uh, give without um, contempt give cheerfully, give without expecting reward. So that was, that was the four part answer to how to, obtain, how to obtain great wealth, dana. Get four different ways of giving or four aspects of good giving, proper dana. And then the third one, which was this idea of like, well, how do I get reborn in a good family, happy family? And this one, well, avoid using words like divisive words, <laughs> avoid using words that cause disagreement, <laughs> help those with wrong views have right views, protect the true Dharma from extinction, and teach sentient beings. Well, teaching usually involves speech in terms of Buddhism, protecting the true Dharma, and also helping those with wrong views usually use, uses some speech, uses some persuasive upayak speech, and of course, avoiding you, words that cause disagreement. So these are all sort of about the power of speech. Again, I'm condensing them down to vach speech, like right speech. But, you know, it's a little more nuanced than that, of course, when you get down to the Buddhist four-part answer. That, of course, brings us right up to where we were last time, uh, which was at the end of number three. and. Of course, we read this beautiful poem of Sumati, where she asked these 10 questions of the Buddha. And I mentioned last time that for some unknown reason, the editor and translators of this edition that we are using, the English uh, translation from the Chinese, they decided just to drop the Buddha's answer to the fourth and fifth question. Uh, her, the, her fourth question was, by what, and this is just the English translation as it is in the book, by what means may one be born ethereally, seated upon a thousand petaled lotus to worship the Buddhas face to face? And the fifth question, which is very related, it's why I'm going to do spend tonight on these two. The, the fifth question is, and how can one obtain a free command of superb miraculous powers and thus journey to countless Buddha lands to pay homage to myriad Buddhas? Those are the questions, but again, unfortunately, they they left they didn't do it they left you hanging with the notorious ellipses the three dots uh just you know and so i just want you to know that for the rest of tonight uh yeah for the rest of tonight we are not going to be in this book uh we're going to be uh referring to i did a translation uh this past week or two i did a translation of the chinese 
for the, the Buddha's answers to these two questions. These are really interesting questions. So again, I want to sort of talk about them. Um, I want to talk about the question itself before we even get to the answers. If we have time, if we have time, we can talk about maybe that why they dropped these, what, what editorial choices or decisions probably went into that. We can, might get into that, but let's, let's just stick to the, the, the case at hand though, which is getting to these answers. So again, her questions were, and the language here is very interesting. By what means may one be born ethereally? Let's, let's just stop there. That's the question. And if, if, if you um, remember what I was saying a moment ago, these questions can, can be read or understood as kind of naive. Like, I've heard, I've heard this wild talk of the yogis you know, being reborn by magical transformation on lotus flowers. Like, how do you do that? Right? You can kind of read these as like, if, if you don't know, if you've never been reborn on a thousand petaled lotus flower, then the idea is like, I've heard about this, or I've seen this. So I want to spend just a few uh, moments, few minutes talking about this idea of being born or reborn ethereally. Forget about the lotus uh, on a thousand petaled lotus flower. Let's just hold off on, on that aspect of it. The, the, the Chinese here um, is this uh, Hua Sheng transformation birth of what the two characters mean. And it's a pretty standard phrase in Buddhism to be born or reborn, but let's just keep it simple, to be born by transformation. Um, a, a, great, a great text to quote about this is the Vajra Sutra, the, what's also known as the Diamond Sutra. Um, and in it, in the beginning, one of the uh, beginning chapters, the Buddha talks about all kinds of sentient beings, whether they're born from a womb, born from an egg, born from moisture, or born by transformation. And then he goes on to say some wild things about if I, even if I caused all those beings, all the beings born by womb, by egg, by moisture, and even beings born by transformation, even if I caused them all to enter nirvana right now, in reality, no sentient being would ever reach nirvana. <laughs> That's sort of the, the paradox of the Vajra Sutra. We don't need to get into the paradox of the Vajra Sutra right now, but that four part classification, mammalian by womb, by egg, by moisture, which there's a lot of ways to think of that, but just, you know, a lot of ways to think about birth by moisture. But that fourth one, birth by transformation, that's what we need to talk about really quickly. Again, this is an old idea, appears in the Vajra Sutra, appears in older, older uh, Pali Suttas. And this language, just to cut to the chase, this is the language of being born by transformation is the language of, that Buddhism uses for entering into usually a jhana or a dhyanic state, a meditative state, also samadhis, high, these higher, deeper concentrations. The language that's used in this is, is kind of a birth, a rebirth, a rebirthing or a birthing in and or by way of transformation. And a really quick reference for this, if you're interested, is one of the oldest, one of the oldest suttas, one of the oldest Pali suttas, the Samanapala Sutta, or the Shramanabala Sutra, the fruit of being a Shramana, the fruit of the homeless life. If you read that sutra, the fruits of the homeless life, among, among others, many, 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 this is just the classic, the classic source for this information. 
by doing sati mindfulness uh, well enough, long enough, I, you know, I don't know, but if you do sati mindfulness practice, there is this process by which one creates what the Buddha calls in the text, at least, a mind-made body and essentially sort of transfers one, one's conscious experience into that mind-made body made of form. And then from there can, oh, well, basically obtain the supernatural powers, pass through solid objects, levitate, all kinds of things. But it's through this transformation birth out of the body, as you know it, as we know it, as I know it, and then born by transformation in this other body, in this other realm, these dhyanas, these states, this all gets a little tricky, especially when the Buddhists and other Indian meditation traditions are very clear that these are almost kind of like spatially places that are like vertically above us and things of that nature. So it's like, are these literally places I'm being reborn? Are these states of mind? I don't actually think it's uh, interesting even to pick one or decide on one. I think they're speaking about a, I think they're speaking about a different way of being in the world. <laughs> so different, in fact, they're kind of referring to it as a whole birth, a whole born again kind of process. So that is just this concept of being uh, born by transformation. Now we need to talk about being born or reborn by transformation. What the text beautifully calls, by the way, born ethereally. Ethereally is a kind of tip of the hat to this idea that you're being born on these more ethereal planes, the plane of pure form, the rupadhatu as it's called, or even the arupadhatu, the, the formless realm. So how does one, uh, one be reborn, transform by magical transformation, seated upon a thousand petal lotus flower? Okay, so now we're really getting somewhere. This is the, this is the real question. I'm sure you've seen, I mean, I have a, a, I have a few rough images that, around here, but I'm sure you've seen the Buddha seated on a thousand petal lotus. I, you must have seen this, right? This sort of image, I have like a, one of these, he's seated on a thousand petal lotus. That's a, it's a standard Buddhist image. It's definitely kind of um, rather iconic, of course, of the Mahayana tradition. And this is certainly a Mahayana Sutra. And, you know, the Mahayana are really into this idea of the Buddha on the thousand petal lotus flower. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. And then, and then we'll read how to do it. We'll read the Buddha's answers for how to actually do this. Um, because I always want to make this as interesting as possible. Let's, I want you to think about it this way. It's about... It's, well, it's about this metaphor of the, the flower. Lotus flower, sure. You got to love the lotus flower, right? Starts off in the mud and then rises above it and then flowers. That's beautiful. But the idea of, of flowers in general, this, there's this initial stage of a flower, which is its budding, when it, the flower buds. Before that, it's like kind of really like, and then it buds and it opens, right? The English word bud comes from the Sanskrit bud, buddha. The, and so there's this play or this analogy that Buddhism is all about. And it's this subtle play with the language of awakening like a flower, budding, budding like a flower. Oh, and so... What I mean to say is, is that you could do it two ways. What's beautiful about it is that you, in terms linguistically, you can think of the flower as awakening, or you can think of 
a process of awakening, like even waking up in the morning as a kind of budding, right? So you can kind of flip it where you're the flower budding or flowers are awakening. And so it's a beautiful play in the Sanskrit of this word bud, bud, buddha. So a buddha is a bud, a bud one, one who is bud, an awakened one. That's why they often translate buddha as awakened one, buddha. And so what, what's going on with that idea of, a, of awakening, right? Well, again, just to make tonight as fun as possible, the idea is that, well, again, we've got places to go, so I'm just going to cut to the chase on this awakening business. <laughs> you could think about this uh, very simply, which is that it's kind of like a dream, and it's kind of like one of those dreams that's one of those dreams where you think it's, you think it's real right? Like often dreams appear to be very real, right? And in a dream that appears very real, you might be afraid of something and be like, oh, I got to get away. I got to find a place to hide, right? Because you don't know it's a dream. So you're afraid of what's coming at you. Or it might be one of those other kind of dreams where you see something that you would like, something that you want, and then you go chasing after it, but something about you can't get it, right? The idea is, is that if you're in a dream, but you don't know it's a dream and you are kind of deluded into believing it. And so then you're like, Ooh, what's that? Let me go chasing after it. Why can't I grab it? This is weird. Or you're like, Ooh, that person's going to come get me better find a place to hide. What happens if you have what's called a lucid dream where you become kind of awake in the dream where you become aware that it's a dream right and so this isn't a true like I, I don't have my real classroom so i can't really the show of hands who's had a lucid dream and all of that but the idea is is that if you've had if you've been gifted to have a lucid dream and you can think about that shift that shift of before when you didn't know any better and you were totally convinced by the dream. And so you were like, oh, oh no. And then something happens and you become lucid. And it's like, oh, wait, this is a dream. I don't have to be afraid of that. Nor do I have to go chasing after that. What's really, really magically important about the lucid dream, and especially again, if you've had it, the reflect, reflecting on it is helpful because what, they're, what, what Buddhism is describing is that subtle shift of awareness where you know it's a dream. You know what's going on here. You didn't know what was going on before. You were totally deluded. You were literally asleep. But then you become lucid in the dream and, you're, and you become aware of it as, as a dream. You become aware of its nature. But it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily like anything changes. You might think that you're in a little closet with a whiteboard and a little library in a dream and then become lucid and you're, and you're thinking, wow, this is a dream of me being in a little closet with a library. It's still here, but my entire disposition towards it would change because of my knowledge, because of this lucid awakening. Well, I suggest that the entire flower budding metaphor of Buddhism is about the idea that there is a process of awakening to out of, out of this. And essentially what I call lucidly living. And in the same way that we're deluded now and afraid of it and want it because we don't understand it, the Dharma and this whole process is about becoming more awake than you think you might already be. And so that process of waking up again, further, more, that's Buddha. And one who is totally awake is the, is the Buddha, right? Is like the fully enlightened one, Tathagata. Okay, so that explains sort of 
the rebirth <laughs> awakening on a thousand petal lotus flower idea any questions about anything before this the new answer the the new answer oh and by the way i had sent the english to gnome and i don't know if gnome had a chance to put in the chat so the english is up there so before we get into my translation any questions comments ideas or epiphanies sorry really straightforward stuff right it's just awakening to the dream of reality and just one comment is that on, on Wednesday nights, we're going through the Lojong slogans. And so we just did regard all dharmas as dreams. And so this seems super related. Yay. <laughs> we're, we're right in the cut. We're right in the cut. Okay. Um, so I'm going to read from my translation here. Like I said, this is not in the book. This is, this are these, these two sections that are in the Chinese that are lovely that read like this and i tried to basically keep the 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 i'm trying to keep it within the language that the book already uses if i were doing a fresh translation this would be a little different but this fits in real nicely with the the book furthermore sumati if bodhisattvas achieve four things they will be born or reborn ethereally before buddhas seated upon lotus flowers. What are the four? Number one, make offerings to Tathagatas at pagodas or stupas and temples with all kinds of fruits, flowers, and fine incense. Number two, do not be harmful or malicious to others. Number three, create Tathagata images dwelling upon lotus flowers. And number four, develop pure faith for Buddha enlightenment or the enlightenment of the Buddha. Then the world honored one said in verse, offering flowers and incense to Buddhas and stupas, not harming others and making images. By the great enlightenment and profound liberation of faith, one attains rebirth before Buddhas seated upon lotus flowers or just upon lotus flowers okay those are the that's the four part answer and i put them up here so this is the four part answer to how one is reborn ethereally by transformation seated upon a thousand petaled lotus flower <laughs> there's some language stuff going on in here um, let's just start with number one. We'll go sequentially, of course. Make offerings to Tathagatas at pagodas slash stupas and temples with all kinds of flowers, fruits, and fine incense. One thing about the language of Buddha and Tathagata, Tathagata, this very kind of mystical idea for, um, well, for uh well for the buddha but it's a very mystical idea of this idea of a present very very present a present time tathagata a, a very interesting tathagata means thusness as it isness so tathagata is a title for the buddha sugata is a title for the buddha there's these 10 titles of for the buddha buddha i just went over means awakened one and while there are technical dif differences between Buddha and Tathagata, like if you really get into the nitty gritty of stuff, there's a, a, a certain time and place to use one and who uses one towards whom and all this stuff. But I got to tell you, as a linguist, because I'm kind of a linguist, I'm not, uh, I'm not the best you know but i've done a lot of study at it because a lot of this is in well the the chinese is in very fixed forms and basically i have found in reading especially questions four and five here where they use buddha and tathagata a little interchangeably i have found that basically in chinese they're trying to keep uh four character four character so eight character sentence patterns 
And sometimes you need two characters, which is the Tathagata has two Chinese characters. And sometimes you need, only need one. And Buddha, or the character Fo, that's just a single character way of saying Buddha. So basically, linguistically, they're choosing based on poetically which will fit their format better. So I have translated this, you know, what they say faithfully to the original. So when it says Tathagata or Rulai, I translate it as Tathagata. When it says Fo or Buddha, translate it as Buddha. So make offerings to Tathagatas or Buddhas. Great. And then the next part about this is that you make offerings to or at these Buddha stupas or Buddha pagodas and temples. So it's this word. It's an interesting Chinese character. It's the Chinese character that the Buddhists, the early Chinese Buddhists, used for the Sanskrit Indian word idea of a stupa. So a stupa is a memorial mound. Uh, sometimes these are very small mounds of earth. Sometimes they're giant like hills. They, they make a, almost a hill of, of earth. The point of a stupa though, these memorial mounds, Typically, there is a relic inside, a bone fragment of a saint, somebody. And so a, memor a stupa is a, um, well, it's a, a, um, a marker, a few, like a marker, like in a cemetery, basically. But when it's a mound like that, it's sort of sacred. And you, again, you put the bone in the middle of it, and then you can worship it. What's very interesting, and I don't, I don't get to talk about this a lot, so I just want to mention it. If you're familiar with the, the Chinese pagoda, right? What's, what's more iconic than the Chinese pagoda, right? The little multi-tiered, simple little tower structure, right? The pagoda. What a lot of people don't know is that the pagoda is a Chinese stupa. But there's something very, very interesting about the pagoda as a stupa, as a reliquary. Because again, stupas, these mounds of earth, you put a relic in them, they were reliquaries. Well, you know, uh, this is like where I would just all night, we would just like take the exit right here and talk all night about this idea. So I'm going to have to to condense it. But I've talked a lot about the Tathagata, the present Buddha, in that when one is engaged in Dharma discourse, reading the words of the Buddha, these aren't my words. I didn't come up with these. I'm some sort of, uh, you know, spokesperson, mouthpiece for these ideas. But these are the Buddha's ideas. This is the Dharma. And so there's this way in which the Tathagata is this present body of the Buddha. Okay, so that's like the Tathagata, and that's a very Mahayana idea. It's a little trippy, it's a little mystical, where the Buddha is like, you know, wherever the Dharma is being preached, there's the, the Tathagata kind of an idea. But the Mahayana is really into that. It's really into you not not thinking the Buddha was a dude from, you know, 2000 years ago. And, and, oh, I got the bone. I got a bone. I got a tooth of a dude from 2000 years ago. Let's put it in a box and worship it. What's interesting, and this is what I don't have time to, to do tonight. What's so interesting about the Mahayana is that they see, they see this, this book as a reliquary. These words are the relics. This is the real body of the Buddha. And this is a reliquary. And so what happens when you put a bunch of books in a tiny pagoda building? That's a stupa, but it's a Mahayana stupa, i.e. a library. So what's really, really cool and wild about pagodas and Mahayana is that libraries are these wild mystical reliquaries for wisdom bones right wisdom bones <laughs> so that's very cool so when they use this character 
as a translator, you are pressed to make a choice. The character means pagoda, but they would like you to know about the stupa idea. So now we're talking about make offerings to stupa, to thagata stupas, Buddha stupas, Buddha pagodas, and temples with all kinds of flowers, fruits, and fine incense. All right, that's number one. Well, but stupas are also like kind of symbols, right? Like, um, yeah. So not only like, you know what? I think often what happens is like when, when people think um, conventionally about stupas that they think, um, you know, it, it, it's, it sounds very, even though Buddhism is a religion, but it sounds really religious, you know, which it is, you know, a lot of people are, you know, going to, um, um, Bodh Gaya, right? And there you see the stupas or in Nepal, um, um, how is it the biggest stupas called? Um, Swayambhu. Mm -hmm. So it is a worshiping, but it's, but it's also, a, um, a symbolism and actually, um, yeah, we, we built a, a stupa in my hometown in Austria. Like, uh, so we, I went through this whole process of filling a stupa with a lot of mantra rolls. Like, I think we had 500 mantra rolls and in the stupa we had like this mandala and it's, it's almost five meters high. So it's pretty big actually. And, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, I, um, it took us, uh, yeah, it, it, there's a lot of symbolism involved and I think it was for me kind of the most important um, aspect of, of a stupa. Yeah. Just sharing. <laughs> yeah, no. And thanks for sharing Connie. And I actually appreciate it because you kind of hit, you hit on the theme for tonight, which is sort of the worship idea or the, what maybe just called religious. I think you just use the word religious in that sense. The word we're going to be talking about in a minute is uh, Shraddha. Shraddha, which is a really interesting idea in Buddhism. It comes up more, more than you would think. And it is very much in this very first one, this idea of making offerings. You just described a very Vajrayana version of the stupa where it's like not even the books, not even the books are going in. Mandalas, treasures, Vajras, like that practice in, in Vajrayana Tibetan Buddhism of stupas yeah definitely the symbolism connie for sure and like you know i think part of my mission in life is to like really help people appreciate how wild and beautiful vajrayana is because <laughs> th this yeah. of course this of course is a very like n i've said this it's like this is not a vajrayana text but it's it's getting there mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. thank you yeah yeah thank you again so i we are i want to talk about this idea of making offerings Again, like I mentioned last week, these answers are operating on many different levels. And so they are, with number one, definitely saying at that kind of quotidian, mundane level, they are saying, yeah, go to Buddhist holy sites, temples, monasteries, pagodas, stupas, whatever. Go to Buddhist holy sites and with all kinds of flowers, fruits, and fine incense, make offerings. This is your first take. This is your first way to be reborn ethereally on a thousand petal lotus flower. <laughs> and I'm going to help us get there. I want us to like understand how it is that this all culminates in this idea. And so the first one is to understand that they are talking literally about that per offering. But as we go through these, though, I want you to, well, yeah, I want you to be thinking about what would be called the religious aspects of Buddhism, the religiousness of these things. Because I want to get into that a little bit tonight, because it's what question four or what answer four and five are very much about. Again, this uh, Shraddha, but Shraddha is going to be interesting. So I, it's actually number four. Um, develop pure faith. That's Shraddha. You know, I think in all the lists so far, 
w like one of them is always some real practical like practical advice that way so this one is the do not be harmful or malicious to others uh by the way the word for this the number two is a, a ahimsa the the chinese it's it's a little more complicated in terms of what it says but it ultimately says practice ahimsa or nonviolence or uh, towards, towards others. Number three, create Tathagata images um, of them dwelling upon lotus flowers. So again, they use Buddha Tathagata interchangeably and so create images of the Buddha dwelling on lotus flowers. Yes, I think they are literally, like we talked about last week with one of them, I think at one level they are talking literally about getting out some clay, getting out some paints, getting out some something and making images of the Buddha. Like kind of Buddha, traditional Buddha, but like we also talked about last time, I think it, the Buddha or Tathagata image could be quite broad, <laughs> very, very, very broad. It does not need to be anthropomorphic is what I'm saying. This particular one, though, is about creating images of the Buddha, literally the one seated on the lotus flower. And, you know, there's a number of different ways that one could imagine how that could lead to the sort of rebirth on a lotus flower. Um, the, the one I'm thinking about is a slightly more um imprinting kind of hypnotism where if you create images of beings on lotus flowers that might help imprint that idea and image into your meditation practice but i also think there's something more going on there just about like um oh yeah it's just you know it's something i don't i can't again it's another exit that i'm not going to take and it's the deeper symbolism of the lotus flower that even goes back to like Egypt and all kinds of places where there's this really heavy, heavy, heavy lotus flower image going on with a lot of meditation. This it has to do with the, um, well, it has to do actually with the lovely language of being born seated on a lotus flower so there's the idea in buddhism of the lotus throne there's the idea of just like um well again it's an exit i can't take but it's sort of again related to what i just mentioned about a kind of imprinting where you make images to get that image sort of in your mind but there's also a sort of a classic visualization in Buddhist traditions that you might think you're seated on a zafu or a pillow or a cushion or the ground or whatever. And there's kind of this visualization of turning that zafu or tur turning that chair into a lotus flower and kind of then um, visualizing that rebirth that I was describing, that awakening. There's a bunch of other stuff. Again, and this is a whole exit that I can't take. And it's about the symbolism of the lotus flower in all kinds of ways. Um, but uh, Michael, the, um, please, the please flower, save me. No, 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 I'm not saving you at all. But the lotus flower, it has something to do with mud, right? Like the lotus flower that is coming through the mud through the delusion and, and blossoms, right? Is this it, has something to do? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. that, 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 is def, that is definitely a play, but I just was, I, this is the exit. I can't take the exit. Oh. But there are other sutras and also other meditation traditions, non-Buddhist meditation traditions. But there are many Buddhist sutras that they get a little more specific into the exact anatomy, or I don't know if that's the right word, but the exact anatomy of lotus flowers, the way they have the pod thing in the middle with all the dots and they have the seeds in the pod with this array 
there's a certain thing going on. Again, it's an exit we can't take, but it has to do with some deeper symbolism mm -hmm. of the lotus flower. Okay, let's get to number four because that's what it's about. And we're basically right at the halfway point. So this would be a good moment to try to move along. Number four is the, you know, in number four in each of the lists, number four, it's kind of always like, ooh, 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 bam. And that's like, whoa, wait, what? <laughs> like really knocking you out. And so number four is this idea of developing shraddha, the pure faith for Buddha enlightenment, for the enlightenment of the, the Buddha, for Bodhi. I spent a nice couple minutes earlier talking about Bodhi, Bud, Buddha awakening, this idea. So for tonight, forget enlightenment. We're not going to go with the light metaphor tonight. We're going to go with the awakening metaphor. There Oh, this is another thing. It is, it's so complicated. It has to do with this word faith and how problematic it is because it's like right away, you know, talk about a word that, you know, I'm looking at all these different Zoom windows and talk about a word that could definitely mean something different to each person in, in the Zoom classroom, right? Faith. So that's tricky. Um, the, again, the word is shadha. Uh, S, but the sh, R, A, D, D, H, A, and the word that word actually means conviction. Like it's it's this conviction. It's just like um, no doubt. I believe would be another way to say it. no doubt. Solid. I'm solid. That's faith. Shraddha, that's Shraddha in Buddhism, conviction. And in particular, by the way, and I don't, I don't want to get too into this either. Shraddha, conviction in Buddhism, it is very much about like power of positive thinking. <laughs> it's very much about the, and the flip, the flip side always, the power of negative thinking, the power of bad negative thinking versus the power of good positive thinking. So doubt, conviction, that, that's what's at play. And so when you hear this, how, I want to get re, be reborn on a thousand powdered lotus flower. How do I do it? Well, develop this conviction for Buddha enlightenment. This is not saying, get on your knees, buddy, and worship the Buddha. Not really. This is not really what that's saying. This is about this, and the language, by the way, is develop. It's encouraging you to develop it. It's not suggesting, you know, have it immediately. It's this idea of develop this conviction or certainty regarding this awakening thing I was just talking about. <laughs> To put, it, to put it my way, right? That's the idea is like in a way that you will never achieve such awakened states, certainly if you doubt yourself or doubt their existence or anything like that. So again, I just want you to know that this faith in Buddhism is not about that sort of humility, but it is also though, it is, yeah, I mean, I, again, we're at the halfway point, so I want to move on to question five, but I also want you to know that there is also part of shraddha, part of this process is also something called pranidhana. And it's this sort of, pranidhana kind of means submission and, and humbling to Buddha, to a bodhisattva, it's a whole world of practices, very much leads into Vajrayana. But from a Buddhist point of view, you can think of it as a antidote for ego, right? You can think of this kind of hu hu humbling, surrendering oneself as an antidote, antidote to pride, an antidote to, to narcissism and all these things. And uh, this is a good segue. 
uh, I will open it up for questions in a second, but I want you to know that Sumati's next question, question five, is, and how do I develop those superpowers I'm hearing everybody talk about so that I can travel to Buddha lands? That sounds fun. How do I do that? Well, this happened in the Vimalakirti Sutra, and it's actually part of a process. You don't get to have superpowers. You don't get to have the bala, the power, the siddhis, or the riddhis, abhinya, super knowledge. You don't get to have that until you humble yourself. Sorry. It's, it's actually part of the deal that you, and it kind of makes sense also, again, from that Buddhist point of view in terms of blinders, narrow, myopic, clinging to self versus these more freer, broader uh, modes of being that come about from this kind of surrendering oneself. Higher power, Buddha, Bala Lin, frankly. It, from the Buddhist point of view, it is about the heart surrendering to, to Allah, to Jesus. It, from, again, from a Buddhist point of view, I don't think it actually matters. Uh, f from a technological, from a technological point of view, I think the Buddhists have a very uh, advanced technology of submission, if you will, <laughs> where it's like, whoa, if you submit to this versus this versus that. So it's a whole science of this process. But number four is definitely what allows for rebirth on a thousand petal lotus flower. Okay. There's any questions, comments, or ideas about that process of ethereal rebirth? Now's the time. Otherwise, question number five. Furthermore, Sumati, if bodhisattvas achieve four things, um, they will journey from one Buddha land to another Buddha land. This is where Chinese is, is fun and rough. The Chinese literally just says, if Bodhisattvas achieve four things from one Buddha land to the next, <laughs> that's all it says. And part of Chinese is filling in blanks from previous sentences. It's just how the language works. So I have filled in the blank there. Um, you know, in other Dharma talks, I've talked about the Buddha Kshetra, Buddha fields or Buddha lands. This is a very complicated idea. Um, if, if you were following me before about rebirth by transformation in these meditative realms, dhyanas or samadhis, if you were following me about that idea of like considering that or thinking of that as a rebirth, like out of this situation and into a different situation, well, that, hmm, those realms, the realms of pure form, as they're called, the Rupadhatu realms, the, the dhyanas or jhanas, as they're called, there's a whole, um, a whole aspect of, of Buddhism that really needs to be talked about or addressed or written about certainly and it is basically about the practice of what's called the brahma viharas or the immeasurables the four immeasurable minds which are also these kind of realms of pure form they're accessed via metta karuna mudita and upeksha right there's a whole part of buddhism that needs to be sort of fleshed out which is that so-called pure land Buddhism, like the land of pure bliss, Amitabha Buddha's uh, pure land, the Sukhavati Vyuha. Well, it looks like there's this way in which while the Buddhists were exploring the Brahma Viharas, and they were like, ooh, you know, if you extend loving kindness out towards all beings, you really slip into this juicy, sweet uh, jhana. Oh, and if you really start extending com uh, compassion or karuna out towards everybody, you'll kind of slip into this like deeper 
uh, kind of realm. And if then if you really start giving like joy towards everybody, you'll really go really deep and you'll pretty soon wind up in Upeksha. It looks like at some point somebody like zipped over here and found Amitabha's Pure Land and was like, yo, I took a left at the third uh, Jhana and I found a Pure Land. So rebirth in Amitabha's pure land is very connected to the last question four. And it's very connected to this language of how do I get to travel from one Buddha land to the next, right? How do I get into even deeper meditative states where I can take a left and head over to Amitabha's pure land? Or like I have often said, these Buddha lands might be other planets and we might have it all twisted about rocket ships and, and stuff. And the way to get to these other planets might not be with a rocket ship, right? So there's also, I give, you know, I'm, I'm always, you know, there's a lot of people out there in the Buddhist world that kind of believe that these Buddha lands are other places and not mental states here, but other places. And I respect, I respect all ideas in that way. And so they could be talking about how do you travel to other planets, other dimensions, other meditative realms. List goes on and on, really. From the way that I'm interpreting this text, I think it's probably nice and helpful to, again, consider the young Sumati sort of you know, you can imagine her being eight years old and hearing stories about bodhisattvas traveling to all these Buddha lands. And it's like, ooh, that sounds so sci-fi, space age, wonderful. How do I do that? How do I travel from Buddha land to Buddha land? And the Buddha's answer is number one, see others well without hindrances or defilements. You, you want to travel to a Buddha land, right? Get your mind right. <laughs> and of course, this is a Mahayana sentiment that we, we've seen this before, right? That there, there is this sort of Mahayana thing that's saying, no, no, the Buddha lands are not over there, over there. They're up here. And if you change the way you see the world, you could be in a new Buddha land or be in a, a Buddha land. Uh, by the way, I have to say, number one and two, question, the answers to number one and two, in the Chinese, they're very intertwined. I had a very difficult time separating them out. I'm not exactly positive I did it right. And there's also a way that number, number one and number two are sort of like, um, so here's, here's what I mean to say. So number two is, when others are teaching the Dharma, do not feel, the word is literally taste, but the, I think the, 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 what it, the meaning is to, to feel, do not feel it as a hindrance. And again, there's a way that the Chinese is tricky because it, it kind of sounds like it's, it's saying that when, I, there's a way that the Chinese, like when you read it, you're like, yeah, and then when you try to say it in English, it's like, oh, but then I'd have to like, uh, and it gets all weird and crazy. And so I did my best here. But what I want you to know what this is about, the answer number one and two, it's about like, oh, we, we actually, we talked about it one night a while ago. Uh, I, I forget which sutra it was but it's the practice of viewing everyone as your teacher, viewing everybody as an enlightened Buddha. This is along those lines that it's basically saying that like, if you see someone teaching and you, you, you feel or taste like what they're saying is kind of wrong, or it's like, like you don't get it, you shouldn't like slander them or speak badly about them. So these two are, it's not, what I mean to say is, is that number one, that how do, how do I travel from Buddha land to Buddha land? Well, see others well. It's not clear if it means just see all other people well, or if it's specifically saying that these other people that are teaching the Dharma, you should look upon them favorably and not slander them. 
All right. And this is actually, it's, you know, again, the Chinese is really complicated and I'm not, I, I know I got the sentiment right, but I'm not sure I got the language right in that sense. There's something really interesting going on here and it's about, well, again, you know, time, oh, time. <laughs> All right. So I already mentioned that there is a tradition in Buddhism that these Buddha lands, these pure lands or Buddha Kshetras are other places. So just put that in your back pocket that that might be totally possible and this is how to get to those other places, all right? But from my Mahayana read of this where the Buddha, you know, all of these answers, the Buddha has been kind of flipping it. How do I get rich? Give things away, right? That kind of flip. And so the naive question is sort of like, yeah, I want to go to this other planet, this other dimension. How do I get there? The answer is about this confrontation with other people, not confrontation, but encounter, I should say, encounter with other people, in particular, other teachers. And, oh, it's such a beautiful idea. It's such a beautiful idea that I want to find the right way to convey it. But, you know, it, it has to do with this, um, it has to do with Bo the idea of Buddha nature, that we all have the Buddha nature. But it's, it's more subtle than that. And that's already a subtle idea. But, well, okay. All right, it's not too late to obliterate objective reality, right? Yeah, so here, this is very helpful from uh, a Buddhist point of view, from a Dharma point of view. There's, there is a certain mentality, let's call it, a, a, a call it a worldview, a drishti, call it a drishti. And this is very, it's a very, very uh, common worldview. It's very common. And as, as common as it is, as like seemingly obvious as it is, as it is, it is nonetheless the subject to this day of intense philosophical debate. <laughs> and what this idea is, is it is the, uh, the, I don't know what you would call it, a belief in an understanding of an objective reality. Versus a subjective reality. And I'll give you, if you're not, you know, if this already sounds too weird and philosophical, like, whoa, wait. It's simple. It's, it, and it, it's complex because these are weird ideas, but the idea of an objective reality is the notion or the idea of what could be called, or what I like to call the God's eye view of things the objective from the sky, God's eye view of the situation. I'm just a little subject. I'm a little subjective being in the world and I only have access to my, well, whatever comes into my purview, right? So, you know, take something like the 2020 census, the great census of 2020, right? We're going to go out, you know, and trust me, friends, this is not a political thing. I'm not talking about that. This is philosophical. 2020 census, we're going to go out and we're going to count up all the people in the United States. We're going to count them all up. We go door to door. How many people live here? How many people live there? And we're going to total up all the people in the United States. Now, of course, it gets tricky, right, because all kinds of things can go wrong, but there is a belief or an understanding that there is a literal objective view of reality in which there is a fixed number of people in the United States that can be counted and understood. 
I may not know it. That's my subjective view. I may get some data. I might get some data that I believe or I don't believe, and that's up for me. And so my subjective reality might be all kinds of things. But there is this belief that there is an objective reality though, right? Even though me and you and you and you and actually nobody ever gets to have it, we believe in it. Even though you can never go and check out objective reality, there is a certain, again, I dare say belief in its truthful, in its reality. Even though, again, all I ever get is my subjective, my subjective view of reality. What if there is no objective God's eye view of reality? What then? But this is my, um, oh, it's my favorite topic, obviously. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't really, really, really get your example. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't really resonate with me or it's not coming through. Is this something like what you're explaining um, to do with, um, in, in a different context, maybe, between idealism and materialism or idealism and physicalism because in idealism or monoism there's only experience right um and physicalism says or materialism says there is such something such as an objective reality outside of experience and idealism says well there's only experience right so only yep. subject experience is this what you, I mean, it's a different yep. context, but is nope. this going this direction? Oh. Exactly. And so idealism, as it's called in the West, or this idea of, of like the subjective view is kind of all there is. Yep, that's that. And the, you know, the objective view, yeah, that it's a really tricky one again, because the, you know, the history of Western philosophy is this idea, or it's wrestling with the history of Western philosophy is really wrestling with to what degree are my senses giving me an accurate representation of reality. Right. The objective view is that there is such a thing as, as, as it, and then my senses maybe tweak it or whatever. <laughs> and, there's this all, again, I can't even get into the history of Western philosophy and wrestling with this, but there's a, a, there's a way in which even in the, you know, it's called postmodernism to a certain degree, but there's a way in which the West has abandoned objective reality to a certain degree, but it hasn't really ab abandoned it entirely, again, because there's a worldview that, I mean, we all share it. It's very deep, but I would, I would encourage you just because I want to get back to the text, and I'm going to make this relevant in a second too, by the way. But I would encourage you to, if you, if you do understand what I'm talking about, about like the God's eye view is, is nice to think about and all, but there is nobody to actually have that view. So there's just beings having their unique all human, all too human view. And yeah, I might go up in an airplane and then that would be my subjective view. So I'm not literally talking about a above view. I'm talking about a view that could actually like, hold all this information in that way. And so again, if you abandon and say, wow, that's that subjective, or sorry, the objective view of reality, well, any concept of an objective reality is part of the subjective experience. So, so one, one other thing, and I know you have to um, continue, but mm -hmm. I mean, I can say, I mean, like with America and like so many people are living in America, it's a little bit difficult to, uh, I, because you could also say an objective reality is, for example, we have 70 people on this Zoom call, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody would say because there's one in seven. So we are 17. So it's an objective, so to speak, reality. We all can agree, you know, there yep. are 17 people. But, what? but hey, what about, say, uh, you know, yeah, Edward, Edward Snowden? Snowden? Maybe Edward Snowden's on the call. Oh. Mm -hmm. and, but and, but, but so... There's no, a shared objective reality. 
This is different. No, I, in, in, there's intersubjectivity. Yeah. Now the intersubjectivity, we're talking Buddhism. Definitely. There's like intersubjectivity where our subjective realms are kind of like, this is getting too far afield I, I, because I want to bring it back to the text. Yeah. Sorry. But if we do, oh, so the idea is, is like the objective view is the, the view that knows exactly how many people are really on this call. And the idea okay. is they, they, they call, sorry, say one last thing. The call example is really stupid because it's in the World Wide Web. You know, this is <laughs> indeed, indeed. Room, you know? But <laughs> if I, okay, if I come and visit you and I have three dogs with me, three dogs, you, you and I, we can like, there are, there are no four dogs. There are three dogs. Yeah, this is again, this is go. this is yeah. going, it's, it's actually, this would be a great conversation to keep having. And so I don't want to actually discourage it in that way, but it's, it's taking us in a direction I'm trying not to okay, go I'm, in. I'm pulling back next yeah. time. Please. Sorry, Connie. Mm -hmm. The reason why I introduced this idea is because it's, it's very an important part of, well, certainly Mahayana Buddhism, but I would say all of Buddhism is an important interrogation of this idea of subjectivity and objectivity. And, you know, just looking at that. But what I was getting at was if, if we presume the objective God's eye view of reality, then you and me are all together in on earth or in whatever we're together in this from that objective point of view and that's why i brought up the census kind of examples that we would all be together in that if you abandon that idea even if you abandon it from the philosophical point of view of its inaccessibility to you if you know what i mean it's sort of like it, it might theoretically be possible, but never for me. So I might as well get rid of it. It's just subjectivity. What I'm getting at is that then we all sort of are subjectively in our own world. Really deeply, literally. If there's an objective reality, then yes, we are on earth together. In, in, on, and I mean on earth, the planet, the big, you know, the whole thing. The idea here is, is that if you, again, you get rid of the objective reality that view, that thinks it can view things from that point of view. And then you're like, oh, wow, that's right. I've always just always been here <laughs> having my subjective experience. And each of you have always been you having your subjective experience. Where I'm going with this again, <laughs> this has been so long winded. I hope it was worth it. But the idea is, is that from that level where we are all subjectively in our own little subjective world, that's your Buddha land. That's your Buddha land where you're the Buddha. How is it going? So how do you travel from one Buddha land to the next? I got 17 Buddha lands right here. And I'm, and I'm, that's the idea here is that these Buddha lands are all these other minds of sentient beings in various states of enlightenment. And if you have the right eyes to see it in full states of enlightenment, that's how you travel from Buddha land to Buddha land. Wait, so are you saying that like we travel to somebody else's subjective reality into their Buddha land? I'm saying that when we have in, uh, intersubjective experiences like this, these are Buddha lands colliding or something to that effect. <laughs> Way to go, Michael. That was, that was, I did not see that coming. That was just, <laughs> you just dharmically slapped me in the freaking face. Yeah. Wow. I, 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 I just one other, just quick thing is that, um, uh, I mean, I feel like Buddhism needs to uh, have a like out front disclaimer what we're talking about is subjective reality. Like that's what we're in the business of. So if you're trying to create shared worlds, that's never what we're talking about. I'm sure they address it, but, but, but it's seated in 
I mean, that's how you get to no self. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's always that. And, uh, and I think one of the questions for me is like, and what is liberating about that? And mm. anyways, y- coming here teaches me some, she gets me closer, but, um, thanks for that. That was, uh, that was well worth it. Yeah, my pleasure. In regards of naming, could we call this shared borderland this collective reality that is experienced in, in modern language? When we say you have your your borderland and I have, so to speak, mine, and the experience when we interact with each other, although on an ultimate level there are no two, blah, blah, blah. This is a collective reality, that collective experience borderland. Because I can have my borderland, you can have yours. Mm. At the same time, we can have a shared, like, shared borderland in that sense absolutely this also has deeper levels too where you know we're all just the one buddha trying to wake up kind of thing so there's the the one buddha land in that sense but even before that oh no yeah i lost it sorry Mm -hmm. happens sorry can i I yeah yeah Sorry, um, so, okay, so going back again to, so the, the, que- the question five is like, how do you journey from Buddha land to, to another Buddha land? So, and you're talking about the concept of like, yeah, we're our own Buddha, we're experiencing subjectively our own Buddha land. So when it says to journey from one Buddha land to the other, is that just another realm in our own experience, like another jhana or something like that, that we're traveling to? Nope. Okay. Great question, Tanya. Because the point of it that I wanted to get across is this really kind of interesting idea that you could see encountering another person as encountering a Buddha and going to their Buddha land. Okay, so what you were saying before, again, that sort of inner acting of all these, okay. Yep. All right. And, and of course, if this is just lowly planet Earth, you know, next to Mars and stuff, and I'm out in the streets just meeting other mammals. <laughs> that's, that's one way. That's one way to move through the world. That's one Buddha land. But there's another way where you're like, whoa, look at all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas everywhere. <laughs> and so it's a, I guess what I want, want to just reiterate is that it, I think this is a beautiful way of talking about interacting with people. Can I ask a question? <laughs> yeah, of course, Fred. Uh, I don't know, is anybody familiar with the area called mirror neurons? It's a a description, it's 10 years old as a research area, and I haven't looked at it in a long time, but uh, they were were looking at the physiology of of interacting with other people and empathy being an experience of actually having the same physiological, emotional experience that the other person has had. And therefore, the the level of interaction becomes was suggested as well beyond just the physical uh, experience. It was, it was actually more of a, uh, an influence between people. I, I can't describe it, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, anybody, if anybody has any uh, experience with that, I'd appreciate hearing about it, if it might inform this discussion. Yeah, and that definitely uh, sounds like a scientific way of talking about Buddhas vibing off of each other. That's for I, sure. I, I, I wanted to add this in, but, but, but I didn't, uh, but I'm glad that you, um, Fred, that you mentioned that. Uh, I know we're not into getting scientific, but interestingly, uh, this you use the same part of your brain to understand yourself as a person that you do to understand the people mm-hmm. in your world. So while the inputs are different, right, you can feel your feelings. Mm. Um, you're 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 processing that information in the same way to figure out like you know future actions what it's like empathy and all that other stuff so you know we have a closer sense of what's going on for us in a way kind of right but uh but we're employing that same ability to figure out the people around us you know so Mm -hmm. uh to me in that way we're we're absolutely sharing uh, Buddha lands with each other. 
Absolutely. With both Fred and Brendan's questions, I just wouldn't want us to drift too far into Neuron land. Just because that's sort of very much sort of an aspect of an objective reality thinking. Mm -hmm. And just, just to keep it in its place, not to diss it. No diss, but just to keep it in its place. And this is, this is part of this like wildly subjective reality. You know, it's, it's deep. And what I mean by that is, is that part of the deeply subjective nature of this reality is that it may very well be I keep looking in the mirror and think I see it because I'm convinced that I should see that. That it's just part of my conditioning to see that that way. And then, of course, what goes along with seeing it that way is a brain with neurons and da 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 but what hap what we're talking about is before neurons and brains and in even all of that so thanks great questions great ideas great comments we got two more quickly of how to do this journeying from from buddha land to buddha land number three is interesting it's this making offerings of candlelight to these Buddha stupas or to Tathagata stupas. This was one that if, if we had more time, I'd spend more time on it. Also very important to notice or to think or consider that this is operating at a very quotidian level, very mundane. This is like, have you ever been to a church? You see all the candles? Yes. Think about it. Have you ever been to a puja? Have you ever been to a fire ceremony? Yeah, that's what we're talking about. So there's this idea that they are literally talking about candles and making offerings of light. And even though you might not be into that, you might want to consider that a lot of people on this earth are into this, call it a ritual, call it a whatever, but this thing of offering, making offerings of candles and light. Interesting, right? I think it's interesting. I, I do it myself, in fact. And so as a mundane quotidian act, I think it's worthy of thinking about. But because we're short on time, I'm not going to go all anthropological, you know, comparative religion on you about why people burn candles and things. Within Buddhism, of course, there is this very subtle, interesting discourse going on about light. And I'm, yeah, I'm talking about light that like allows you to see. But right there, therein lies the mystery of light. It is that it is what allows you to see. And that, that play, the, oh, that, the, the, that right there. Don't, don't bring people darkness, right? Light. How about, you want to do an, how about take yourself out of the 21st century, take yourself out of being a 20th, 20th century baby, take yourself out of the modern world and consider light as one of the most fundamental technologies, fundamental things that bringing people out of darkness, extending the day, allowing for study in the evening, I think our modern world maybe doesn't appreciate light as much because it's everywhere and so easy to get. So there's another layer of light right there. So we have light as wisdom, light as the means to wisdom in a really interesting way. But then the craziest one, there is a Buddha, a Tathagata named Dipankara the lamp lighter Buddha, the lighter of lamps. This Dipankara Buddha is like, a, a, like an original Buddha, like old way, like kalpas, 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 kalpas ago. And when I'm reading this in the Chinese, the Chinese is doing this weird double entendre where it's kind of like you could make offerings to Dipankara or lamp lighting offerings. And what's interesting about this, and I haven't mentioned it, it's the way that the, you, if you have the book, you notice that there's the uh, answer number one, two, three, and four. And then the Buddha repeated in verse. 
man, if you ever get to translating things, you know why they do that. Because when you read the first one, you're kind of like, oh, what, wait, what exactly did he mean? And then you read the verse and it's like, oh, I got it. They really feed off of each other. And so indeed, this is saying like make offerings of light, but there's also a weird, beautiful double entendre going on about this kind of, I don't know, original, er, original Buddha called Dipankara. Again, I was, I was going to say a lot more about light because it's one of my favorite subjects in Buddhism, but, but we got to talk about number four. We got four minutes to talk about number four. Uh, the answer to how to travel from one Buddha land to another, answer number four is be ever vigorous in the practice of all dhyanas and samadhis. Right? That's the last one. I, I'm hoping I did, fortunately, a good enough Dharma talk to where that's not from completely left field because we're kind of going full circle with this idea, right? That I preface this with this idea of the Brahma Viharas and Samadhis and that all of this might be code for meditative states. Well, sure enough, the Buddha's last answer is practice your dhyana and samadhi. That's how you travel from Buddha land to Buddha land, if that's what you want to call it. Right? <laughs> that's it. Of course, I leave that last part wide open still for what does that mean? Like, so if I do samadhi, I go to another planet, another dimension, better mind state. Again, I would encourage you not to even to put your finger on one or the other, right? I would encourage you to like in, embrace the bevy. <laughs> Any questions, answers, comments, ideas? Da, 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 da. What I took, I, hello, Michael. Hey, I. What I wanted to comment about all these fantastic things we were hearing and from everybody about Buddha lands and well one way of very common, uh, uh, a common way to talk about Buddha lands is mentioning that we are in the Buddha land or yeah the, the we uh, we are upon the presence the Tathagata of Shakyamuni Buddha in that way he was the one that started turning the wheel so that happened many thousands years ago. And just to continue with this fabulous idea of, of how to travel to Buddha lands, like, yeah, that guy in India talked about Indian philosophy and meditation 2,500 years ago. But then if you walk down the street and you saw a monk or a guru, whoever inspired you to follow the Dharma in this reality, uh, it is clearly seen as this pointer towards eventually building your own Buddha land. And I think that analogy of how Shakyamuni started, like he was this light that we all eventually start lighting candles based upon this light from one place to another until filling the whole universe. Wow, you, you really did that, didn't you, Eric? You you, <laughs> you brought it back to Dipankara because that was yeah. the, the missing metaphor of the lamplighter Buddha that if you, if you consider this wisdom, if you consider this Dharma, this wisdom as like a, a flame, like a light that, that I'm trying to kindle and share with you, well, lamplighter got the, like lit the torch, so to speak. And so you're, you're, the way you ended that, Eric, was beautiful. Perfect. <laughs> All right, folks. I'm going to call it a night. Thank you all so much for part two. Part three next Sunday. <laughs>